So Michael uh, Manipet, our next speaker, is already here, so just a few minutes to set up. Um, so Michael is coming here from Stripe. Uh, you know, Stripe has millions of dollars in transactions, or millions of transactions every day. Uh, and you know, they're dealing with some interesting uh, challenges in you know, different modeling approaches. So we're very excited to hear uh, about Michael. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thanks, it's all for coming. I don't know why it's so small, your face and questions. Well, anyway, so just sort of about myself. Uh, a long time ago, I was a grad student at Postdoc in Math. That wasn't for me, so I left academia. Although I spent three summers while a grad student working in finance, first in the structure credit and then in the derivatives. Uh, I left academia, went to Google for a few years, and then I uh, left there, and now I'm managing the machine at Stripe. Stripe now, Stripe has around 280 people, 10 of which are on the ML team. Um, we all do a combination of data science and production engineering. So that's about me. So Stripe is a company that provides a collection of unified APIs and tools for managing and taking payments. But I can tell you a lot about the whole commerce stack we're building. But I think that's important for today is like the most basic primitive that we have in Stripe, which is just the ability to take a payment, in particular a credit card payment. Here's a very simple Python code for a charging credit card that actually exists, you can go do it yourself. Um, so at the very core of Stripe is just like this primitive of taking credit card payments. So what happens when someone charges a credit card? Well, see, there are just a few things. Ideally, nothing happens. You take a, you take a payment, you render some service or ship some good, and your customer is happy, and that's it. So that's the ideal outcome. Another outcome is that the payment is refunded, obviously. Uh, and the one that I want to talk to you today about is the last one. And that is when the cardholder disputes or charges back the transaction. So fraud detection is one of these canonical ML problems. Uh, so we'll talk about how we think about that as the plot plan for today. So just in case, I'm sure almost all of you know about chargebacks, but you know, if you open a credit card statement, something looks fishy, you can go on and click some button and that leads to a chain of events that results in the merchant who sold you the good getting some warning that the code holder claims that this was not an authorized charge and you want to dispute it or you want to like, uh, have this discussion about whether or not it's actually legitimate. So there are lots of kinds of disputes. For example, if you have a subscription to the New York Times and you cancel it and they keep charging you, you could have a dispute for recurring charge canceled. But the kinds of disputes we care about the most are ones related to fraud, so fraudulent disputes. Um, two of the most common causes for fraudulent disputes are what you might call a card testing or card caching. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, the theft of all those card numbers from Target about a year and a half ago or two years ago. And what happens for that is they take all the card numbers and then they start selling them in batches online. This respirator or something is a very prominent seller of these card card thefts. So I can go to this website, I can buy, let's say, 10,000 card numbers, and if I'm only willing to pay a small amount for them, then I get low value card numbers. And my goal is then to test each card one by one to verify to see to verify that the card actually still works and hasn't been cancelled. So that's called card testing. And the idea there is that you make very small charges uh, to see if they, if they go through with the hope that they're not detected by the card holder. So let's say we have a thousand cards, we tested them, and now we have a hundred that are really good, or a hundred that we verify to be sort of valid cards. What we do then is we go and <coughs> buy very expensive items with them. So maybe I'll go online to bestbuy.com and buy a TV, one of these cards, and I'll go sell that TV on Craigslist or at the corner of, of my sidewalk and net the profit. And then the card holder is left recording the charge, they dispute it, and then Best Buy ends up having to eat that, uh, that charge. So card testing and card caching are sort of the two, I guess, canonical ways that fraudulent disputes, at least for card not present transactions, arise. And one thing that's interesting about this is it takes quite a long time, as you got sure you can tell from the credit card statement cycle, for these labels to come in. And so we have charges. We want to know what's fraudulent, we often have to wait 60 to 90 days before we get information as to what charges are bad or good. Just in terms of, in terms of vocabulary, I'm going to use dispute and charge back interchangeably, both as an and a verb, and that's sort of the thing that we're trying to detect here, whether a charge is going to be disputed as fraud. 
So any questions about that? So, yeah, so the reason it takes 60 days is because they wait 60 days to test it in order to test No, it. just because, let's say, my credit card gets stolen today, and it gets tested today, I only get my credit card statements, say, three days from that. And, I mean, like, the actual distribution of time to arrive of disputes is something like nothing for five days, and then you have this, the CDF, like, increases when you wait over the next 60 days. So, they come at the right of time, but you have to wait at least 60 days to sort of have a complete picture. Does that answer your question? All right, so a lot of fraud detection models revolve around manual review. So you do some ML, you flag some charts, and a human goes and looks at them. What we try to do at Stripe is to detect them synchronously and decline them in real time. So that means that at the time a chart is made, in that one and a half second that you wait while the spinner is going, Stripe will score the charge and decline it. So we want to have a model that detects charge that lucky bit to get this data and, and does so really quickly. So let's go back historically and talk about things that are roughly true. So let's say it's the end of the year in 2013. And up until that point, there's been no automated threat detection at the company. So we were just letting a lot of fraud through, but that was fine because the company was small back then. But we realized it's time to start building an ML model to catch fraud. So on December 31st, we trained a binary classifier on charges that were made between January 1st and September 30th. And then we valued up that model on data from October. And the reason we're cutting it off in October, in October is for this reason that we have to wait some time before all the labels come in. Okay, so nine months of training data, a month of validation data, and then we look at see how the model performs. So we have like a, you know, an RFC curve, and we can say, okay, well, it looks reasonable that actioning the model by saying, let's block the charge if the score is above 50, gives us the right precision or recall trade-off. So is everyone familiar with the terms precision or recall? Right, so precision is of all the frac of all the charges we think are fraud, what fraction actually are fraud? Or to put it more concretely, we're blocking charges because of this model. Of all the charges that we do block, what fraction are actually fraud? And recall is of all the charges that are actually fraud in the world, what fraction are we catching? Right? So because we're blocking charges <laughs> as part of the charge flow, and because there is no asynchronous mail review by a human. We definitely value precision, even at the expense of recall. So anyway, we built this model over this year of data, or over the time months of data. We have a policy block that scores about 50 that seems reasonable, and we put it into production. All right, so January 1st, 2014, we now have a model of production <coughs> that's blocking charges. So the first question, you know, we trained this model on data that ends on September 30th and we tested it on data from October. So we now have a model that is running a production, but it was a trained on data that's over two months old. And now let's say my boss comes to me and says, you had this model running for all of January. What are the <coughs> production decision and recall? So not the decision and recall from cross-validation, but the decision and recall of the model as it's running in the real world. So that's one question. Another question is, let's say one of our top businesses says, we're getting tons of complaints from our customers that their cards their car aren't going through. You seem to be blocking too much. Your false positive rate is too high. You have to ease back a bit. So OK, we can ease back by saying something like, well, block if the score is above 70, but not if the score is above 50. So what are the decision or recall of that strategy? And if the question is, what are these numbers in production and not cross-validation, how do we answer that? Or even more basic question, why, is the, why are the answers to these questions not obvious? So why, is, why are these two questions not directly answering what? These are the arguments you fought, but you don't know what you did to. Exactly. So we block these charges, and if we block them, we can't observe the outcome. We can't see if the charge ends up being disputed, right? We can't figure out what happened. So uh, we have really no way of saying, at this point at least, what are the precision and recall as they exist in the real world. So we'll get back to that problem 
straight up. So let's say it's a year later. It's now December 31st, 2014. And for a number of reasons, we decide it's time to retrain the model. So we go through the exact same exercise. We'll say we're going to train this model on more recent data. So we'll train it on data from January 1st, September 30th, 2014. We again evaluate it on data from October and look at the RFC curve, and it looks pretty bad relative to what we had here before. So it's more recent data, RFC curve looks worse. And then let's say we put it into production and the results are terrible in the sense that we're getting way more complaints than expected. The results are even worse than they were or that the, than the population suggested. So what happened here? You were training on your filter data. Exactly. Right, so we were, again, we were already blocking charges in production. And if, if, if for training, all we could say is, we're now going to include charges which we observe the outcome, i.e. they were good or disputed, that means we're essentially training on the residual, or just the charges that were not blocked by the previous model. And in some sense, these are the hardest charges because you know, they may have been fraudulent, but I didn't catch them originally. So, you know, one possibility is we'll run the 2013 model and the 2014 model in parallel. Like one model to catch the base fraud and a second model to catch the residual fraud from some of the, the from new patterns in 2014. That's also problematic, right? One problem is that we can't evaluate the residual recall of this ensemble. And more importantly, in the areas in which the 2013 model was bad in terms of precision, there's no way to get that back, right? So doing this on tunnel model is not really feasible in the long run. And we can't, in 2020, have six, seven models running for each of the past years. So the situation is, you know, not that great. And what we really want in both of these cases, and by these cases I mean the case of evaluating the model in terms of the production performance, and of retraining new models. What we want is an approximation of the distribution of charges that would exist in the absence of our intervention. So we have all these charges in, in the world. Some of them get disputed, some of them get refunded, some of them are fine. And we lop off some fraction of them because we're blocking charges. When we evaluate, when we train, what we want is to assemble some approximation of that original distribution. Does that make sense? So the first question is, or our next question is, what can we do to estimate that unconditional distribution? Like what's the most basic thing we need to do to take a step towards answering these problems? Well, the most naive thing you could do is just say, for some fraction of the things that we'll block, let's actually not block them. Right, so let's say for 5% of charges that exceed this triggering threshold score of 50, we'll actually let them through and see what happens to them. So we have a very good strategy, if the score is above 50, and RAND is less than 0.05, then allow it otherwise lock in. So if we do this, how do we compute the, re the precision in production? That's pretty straightforward. We just say, of oh, that fraction of charges that we let through, what fraction of those end up getting disputed. And that's our unbiased measure of precision. So what about recall? If we do this, how do we answer the question, what fraction of all fraud are we catching? So let's say we have the following situation. There are a million total charges, and 90% of them have a score below 50. So they are fine and let them through. Of those 900k, 10,000 get disputed. So if we didn't block them, we can observe the outcome, and we can see that 10,000 10, of them were charged bad. And 890,000 of them were fine. Now let's say the other 100k had a score above 50. So those are the charges we thought were fraudulent. And we left through 5% of them, so that's 5,000 charges. And we then get to observe the outcomes for those 5,000 charges. So let's say 1,000 were, were not fraud, so they were false positives, and 4,000 were actually fraud. So the total amount of fraud we've actually caught here is not 4,000, but 4,000 times 20. 
because for every chargeback we observed in this set of charges we left through, there were roughly 20 in total that we would have blocked, one of which was allowed to go through. So our estimate for how, for how many chargebacks we caught was 20 times 4,000. And the total amount of fraud is you know, 80,000 plus the ones that we would not want anyway, there's 10,000. So our total recall is 80,000 over 90,000, or 89%. So that's our answer to the question of how much of all the fraud that exists are, are we caching with this block if it's about 50, is about 50 policy. Any questions about this calculation? And then similarly, when we train a new model, we draw from the data set any charge for which we do not observe the outcome. So charges that we block do not are not part of the next training data set. We only include charges that we observe the outcome for. But for the ones we would have blocked, we weight them by a factor of 20. Again, for, this, for the reason that for every charge that we would have blocked for which we observe the outcome, there are 19 other charges that were similar I had to have the same probability of being left through, so we shouldn't observe the outcome. Right? So we can add or we can specify the vector of weights when we train with psychic learning. And in cross-validation, we can also specify the weights. So all the charges we left through, all the charges that were okay, plus the charges that we left through probabilistically multiplied by this weighting of 20 is our first approximation to this distribution of charts that exist if there were no blocking. Any questions about that? So where we are now is we have this policy. And the policy says if the score of the charge is below 50, then we allow it, we allow the charge probability one. If the score of the charge is above 50, then we allow the charge probability 0.05. So we have the step function which controls our, our action. So what is not ideal about this? You're exploring it probably suboptimal means if you're very confident that something is broad and white this thing. That's right. So if a charge has a score around 50, then it can kind of go either way, right? It might be fraud, but it might not be. It's right at our decision boundary. If a charge has a score of 100, it's much less to be fraud, right? So in some way, we want more information around, or we want more information for charges around a score of 50 than we do for charges around a score of 100. And put another way, let's say that I'm, we're told something like, you are allowed to incur an extra 10,000 disputes per month. So we actually have a budget for evaluating these models and for producing new training sets. We want to spend that budget in the areas where we get the most lift for evaluation and retraining. And that area is around this phase transition in the curve, not around the place, not around source of 100. So what we really want is something that's more like this red line. Right, so what we'll have now is a propensity function. And that propensity function is going to map the classifier score so the raw probability of fraud to the probability that we allow the charge. And the higher the score, the lower the probability that we allow the charge. And this way we're getting more information on the area that we care about, and we're spending the cost of this without strategy on the charges for which it matters the most. Yeah. So if you think that you know around the threshold it's time to correct one asterisk. Sigmoids or curve graph instead of just curving it on the gradient. Uh, so I guess the the core of the question there is why is this sigmoid asymmetric? Yeah. Well, so let's say what what happens on the other side. So let's say the charge has a score of forty. Right. We're on the other side of this transition. In that case, the probabilistic action would be to block the charge. But if we block it, then it comes out the outcome anyway. So we only get valuable information by reversing the action on the right side. Does that answer your question? I guess in a related question, uh, how do you choose the function, the propensity function, right? I could imagine any number of uh, curves that point 
Okay, sorry for joking. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess the question is how do we actually choose the, the curve? So I'll talk more about that in a little bit later. Okay. Uh, and I'll actually reference a paper where they have a little section on crazy gamma functions you can use. But uh, if you just to answer it briefly, it turns out that for any simple function is, is not that bad. I mean, the shape of the function controls this exploration expectation trade off, but uh, it's not that important, except for a few technologies, which I'll mention in a bit. So, what do we do in production now? We have this propensity function, which is this red line up here, and we say, okay, well, let's score the charge. We have the classifier score, which is a score variable. We map it to the propensity score, which is this variable PS, and we have two booleans now. Would we have blocked it unconditionally? which is the original block variable, and then will we still block it? And then we just choose a random number between 0 and 1, compared to the propensity score, if it's not the propensity score, then we block it. And then we take the action, and in our record, we log each of these things. We log the charge ID, the original score, the propensity score, the original action, and the chosen action, just our chosen modulo of the probabilistic decision. So, you go to your records, and every time there's a charge, we have a record with these, with these entries. So let's say charge 1 has a score of 10. The ability we allow it is 1.0. We would have allowed it, obviously. We do allow it, and it turns out to be fine. Right? The charge is okay, no dispute. We have a charge of score 45. P allow is again 1.0. We choose to allow it in both cases, and the outcome is that it gets up, ends up getting disputed. So that ends up being fine. Score of 55, the goal here we allow is 0.3. The original action is to block, and we do end up blocking it. Score of 65, the goal that we allow is 0.2. We would choose to block it normally. We reverse it by this random choice and allow it, and we get to observe that it was charged back. And there are just two more similar cases. So we have this record now for every charge. The original score, the probability that we allow it, the chosen, or the original action, and the chosen action, and the outcome. So as before in the case where we were, we were uniformly allowing these charges, uh, we will again, for analysis, only consider charges for which we can observe the outcome. But now, instead of weighting them uniformly by 20, so 1 over 0 0.05, we weight them by 1 over the penalty score. Right, because if we have a probability of 0.1 of allowing the charge, and we do allow it and we observe the outcome, then there are in total 10 charges for which the policy would be to block it, for which like, we would expect a similar outcome of a dispute. Okay, so it's like a geometric series, right? Like you're flipping this coin, and the first time it comes up heads is when you allow it, you want to count the total number of flips until you see that. So let's go back to that table and filter it, throwing out all the charges that were not for which we did not observe the outcome. So we have four charges for which we can observe the outcome. And let's say now I ask you, what are the precision and recall of our strategy? So our strategy is to block if the score is above 50. What's the precision of that? I've also added a column here with the weights, which is just one over P allowed. So how do we compute the precision here? Any volunteers? So if there were no weighting and there were just counts, you would say, how many charges meet this policy of score above 50? And how many of them were actually fraudulent? But now we have to add these weights in. So instead of just counting the rows, we'll count things by weight, right? So there are two charges here with a score of a 50, but their total combined weight is 9. And of that total weight of 9, 5 units of weight were actually fraud, right? So the precision is 5 over 9. <coughs> so what about the recall? So of all the things that were fraudulent, there was a total weight of 6, right, charges 2 and 4. And of that total weight of 6, 
five units of weight were caught by this policy. So the precision is pi over nine, and the recall is pi over six. So that's how you would do this calculation given the production data. So what about a counterfactual, a counterfactual policy? So too much is getting through, and now someone says, well, can you stop more fog, maybe by lowering your triggering threshold? So we say, okay, why don't we consider blocking if the score is above 40? So similarly, what's the precision of recall here? Well, there's a total weight of 10 among the charges with a score above 40. And of that total weight of 10, 6 is fraudulent. So the precision is set of 10. And similarly, of all the fraud, there's a total weight of 6. And all the all that would be has a score above 40. So the recall here is 1.0. Wait, so the precision goes up. You go yes. So you would think that as you lower the threshold which you block, the precision would go down monotonically. But that's not true if you're catching so much more fraud by lowering the threshold that it's sort of that it actually will result in an increase in precision. So, yeah, it's more because of the discretization in some sense, right? Yes. And for lastly, the other way, too many false positives, so let's raise the threshold. What's the, you know, what's the position we call if the score is above 62? Since lower computation, all of the weight is fraudulent, so the position is 1, and 5 out of 6 units is a fraud is caught, so the recall is. So any questions about how you do these weighted calculations for model performance? So a couple of notes about this. If these are all estimates, obviously. Precision and recall are estimates of what they actually are, and they are estimates of precision and recall in the absence of the intervention. So the more that we allow through, i.e. the the higher the stationary value of this signal, the better these estimates become. And again, this is actually a contextual abandon problem, right? The more you let through, the less you're exploiting your current model, but the more you get to explore other space. Uh, or figure out exactly what the exploration exploitation trade-off is is, is, is a problem. The other thing to note is that when you're computing these kinds of numbers, you really want to bootstrap your sample. So that means that you would sample all the rows of your table uh, uniformly random with replacement, so not taking into account the weight. And then you do the weighting calculation, you repeat this process a number of times, and you get error bars on the precision of the recall number. So for new models, it's exactly the same thing. Right? You pass in the data using only charges that were left through, and you weight them by one over the penalty score in the training set and in the evaluation set. I think like the, for the key part here, or like the, the most important takeaway from all of this is that like typically if you have a model production, you might say, let me train a new model and then let me compete for the new model in this champion challenger A B test. But if you do this, you can just have this holistic reversal going on in the background. And you can test arbitrarily many models offline. So I can test 100 different models offline without feeding them into production. And you can sort of, by doing that, say or explore space a lot faster than you would have otherwise. And the inspiration for this came from this paper from some people at Microsoft and Facebook on doing a similar analysis, but for click metrics for certain result pages. Uh, so the last things I want to talk about are just technicalities. So first one, not only to the graph, is you know we're letting some fraud through to evaluate things. We know that, but the trade-off is okay because you know, the long-term model performance benefits by doing this. Can anyone think of any other sort of attacks that could be made or any other vulnerabilities that we're doing here? So we know we're admitting that, okay, some of is getting through because we are allowed it to go through. Uh, are there any other vectors for things that might be sub-ideal here? I know this is a very ill-posed question, but I'm wondering if anyone has anything in mind. 
there any autocorrelation in, in the in productivity and the test of product? So that's, that's, that's a good question. I'm not actually going to touch on that, but it is the case that everything that I've mentioned assumes that each record uh, is ID, right? So that we every charge, the features, the score, the outcome are supposed to be independent and they're redistributed. But in reality, if I'm a fraudster and I go in like, and I try 10 cards in sequence, those are obviously correlated. So there are controls that I think you have to think about. Uh, but that's not what I'm thinking about for this, for this question. So if my goal as a fraudster is to figure out if these 100 cards are still valid, how can I still do that in this model? Do you have a thought? Oh, you could try it over and over and over again. Yes, right. So if, you know, if at a score of 100, the propensity score is, say, 0.01, that essentially means that if I try a card 100 times, in the expectation, I'm sort of guaranteed to have strike let it through once, for which, yeah, I've got to show the outcome, right? So if you try things enough for a single card, then, like, the flush is getting valuable information from, from the system. So we don't want it to be the case so that you can keep on hitting us with the same card sort of repeatedly to get information. So what can we do about that? So right now we're picking, for every charge, the charge comes in. We pick a random number, we compare the propensity score. If the random number is the propensity score, then we allow the charge. So any tweak to that we could do so that it's not the case that for every single card, you can just keep on trying a hundred times and get at least one allowed event. We can set the C based on the hash of the card. Yeah, that's exactly right. So instead of picking a random number, let's say we'll just hash the card number and maybe the day, like the card number and the day, and maybe the business ID, some or fixed number that is a function of some things that are relatively static over the course of a day or event, and we'll compare that hash number to the passing score. That way, we'll, we'll probabilistically allow only, say, 98% of cards and not enough charges. So this means that no matter how much you try card X, if that hash ends up being having a value of 0.5, it will never get through even the five star tries a thousand times. So that's one, one issue. Another issue is this graph. So let's say we do this thing where we have the model running in production for a few months. And Using the methodology I described above, we compute the precision recall over a 60-day trailing window. And this is the time series that we get. So you know, on May 1st, we do this calculation over data that's at least two months old. We get the precision recall, we get some numbers, and we're moving this window along, sliding the range of data for computation. And we find that the estimators very wildly. So there are these huge phase transitions. Like, it was stable for a while, all of a sudden, there's a huge jump or a huge drop in the estimate position or recall. So, what could be causing that? You only think about the market that, you know, uh, whoever is trying to get fraud. Anytime you change your uh, fraud detection system, well, so let's say that the, let's say the system is fixed, but it's a higher grade. No, but the UN always think about decision of people who are trying to extract the money from the retailer. So if they determine that you know you increase your uh, uh, like t tolerance, uh, you increase your tolerance for the fraud, then you will try more. If you increase it, they will try less, and over time it will can create a huge impact that. Yeah, so it is the case that we observe deterrence effects in sort of precision recalls over time. So that is definitely something that we do observe. But these huge shifts are not a result of deterrence or anything. In fact, these huge shifts are not a result of any change in foster behavior. So let's say the model and the system is fixed for this entire period, and foster behavior is also fixed. So why could this still happen? Large charges. Sorry. Is it just large charges that are impacting like a small sample size? What do you mean by large charges? Uh, so like if you have a very large charge and you're calculating for by, by large you mean amount? Yeah. Okay. Are you calculating the uh, precision recall numbers by volume or the number of charges that go through? 
So that's a good question, which was, uh, do we compute these metrics based on count or based on dollar volume? We actually do both. Okay. Okay. So let me continue making the question harder by saying that, that let's say this is just by count. So these transitions are not a result of like high dollar value charges going through or not. But I asked you why or what can I buy large for a reason? If you have right tail and then the weight would be huge. Yes, exactly. So if you choose the SA function in such a way that you can have charges that are of extremely high weight. So let's say a score of hundred maps to so probability that be allowed of point zero 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 one. And you have a charge of weight, I don't know, a hundred thousand. Whereas most charges have a weight of, say, between 1 and 10. And one of these super high weight charges gets left through and caught by our system, or would have been caught. That will result in this huge increase in the recall. Similarly, if one of these high weight charges is false positive, we take a huge hit to the metrics and so forth. Right, so back to the original question, the exact form, there are a bunch of things you can do. What you, what you want to avoid is having the right end of that density function have weights that are or density scores that are so low that you have charges such high weight that you can observe these huge jumps in, in the estimates of your metrics. So what is the time horizon by which this thing will converge? So this is almost like central limit theorem in some sense, right? Oh, well, wait, sorry, what was the question? So uh, it's almost like you know you have to have many, many observations that that low probability in order for you to actually Precision yes. Yeah. So it's like central limit theorem. So I'm curious at what time scale does this converge? So we we actually have a lot of we're, we're rolling the window and we're not competing over all the time. So we actually never, never actually observe a converge. Does, does that answer? Like, a, like if you kept the same two models, let's say, okay. and over what time would you actually be certain that one model is outperforming the other? Oh, okay, so I think part of the answer to that is in this like bootstrapping and having the conference intervals around the uh, around estimates. You know, so like we'll have two models or you know, we're not comparing just two models now, right? Like we're you're, you're saying something like we have the production decision or recall for the incumbent model and we can compute the same position or recall metrics over any given subset of the data for a candidate model. And we're not waiting for anything here. We just use enough of this historical weighted data for the common intervals to be destroyed or something like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah a little bit, yeah. Like, I, I was also curious if you actually use confidence intervals in your weights. Like, maybe you had to use, like, Wilson score? That's a good one. We, we don't, yeah, but that's okay. not that we, we should answer yeah. yeah. Because then maybe you could weight it down, like, that won't be 1 by 0.0001, but, like, the lower bound of that. Thing. Right. Yeah. It's not like this thing we thought about, but we haven't done that yet. Well, so just the conclusion here, and you have a model of production, it's actioning behavior in production, and you can inject randomness into the system to understand the counterfactual. Um, instead of arbitrarily testing just two models in this champion challenger or A-B test format, you can test arbitrarily model, arbitrarily many models and policies offline by saving this log data with the capacity scores and all of it on all of the actions. Uh, this is working on being on my team by three of my colleagues, Ryan, Rob, and Melissa, and Shameless Plug. We're looking, always looking for engineer scientists, and using anyone. 